Hi folks, so I'm going to begin our slide commentary just with a brief review of what we saw on slide 12, theories of complete dominance, etc. Uh, just as a reminder, in the first example, we have a heterozygote where there is one wild type allele, one loss of function allele. The wild type allele, although it produces approximately half the functional protein product and activity uh, that the gene would normally make if you think about the nanomoles or micromoles of material that are accumulating. That amount of protein is sufficient for that cell to have normal physiology, normal biochemistry, and have a normal function. That's in contradistinction to the second situation where the wild type allele in a homozygous wild type produces the full function required for that cell's normal physiology and biochemistry. But in the heterozygote where that allele is in trans to the recessive loss of function allele, um, there you're in a situation where the wild type allele now has undergone re-regulation and much more material is produced from a single copy of the gene than would normally be the case. So I hope that's helpful. Now we'll transition on to slide 13. So here we're introducing the idea of incomplete or partial dominance. What does that mean exactly? <clears throat> that means, as I discussed previously, prior to the uh, first exam, that here we have a situation where the genotypes that are present, if you have homozygotes for the wild type allele, a heterozygote, or homozygotes for the mutant allele, that every genotype will be, in a sense, uh, faithfully reflected in the phenotype. So what does that mean? So this is a classic example where we have the uh, R locus for the uh, snapdragon flower. Here there are two alternative types of alleles that we see commonly, the R superscript 1 allele and the R superscript 2 allele. That means then that your average uh, plant can have only one of three alternative possible types of genotypes. Those genotypes are R superscript 1, R superscript 1 homozygote, R superscript 2, R superscript 2 homozygote, or a heterozygote composed of one R superscript 1, one R superscript 2 allele. Now, just for clarity, I'm going to call these R1 and R2 from this point on. So, what are the effects on the phenotype of these particular genotypes? Well, if you are an R1 homozygote, your phenotype is that you have bright red flowers. Conversely, if you are an R2 true breeding line and you are an R2 homozygote, the flowers that you make lack red pigment entirely and the flower appears to be white. This is quite fascinating because now where things kind of get interesting from a Mendelian perspective is when we cross a red true breeding line and a white true breeding line together. In this case, the F1 plant, an R1, R2 heterozygote, produces a novel phenotype, a novel flower color. That flower color is pink. This is what we mean when we have incomplete or partial dominance. Um, the color allele, the red allele, in a heterozygote does provide some color against a, a white background flower. The flower becomes pink um, rather than red or white. But what it doesn't do is completely obscure the presence of the R2 allele in the genotype. That means if you are R1, R2, your phenotype pink is distinctive in relation to R1, R1 homozygotes or R2, R2 homozygotes. Now, the cellular explanation for this trait is interesting because it seems to map to the proportion of color generating plastids, uh, small organelles 
that are responsible for pigmentation in this flower. That if you see, for instance, a red flower, you see cells entirely full of red organelles. If you have a white flower, you see cells entirely full of white plastids. And if you have pink flowers, you see a mix of these plastid types. So in fact, this is kind of a mixing problem. You have um, the ability to confer on plastids a full red color, a full white color, or have a mix of those plastids create a cytoplasm that to the human eye causes an intermediate phenotype between the extremes of red and white. Now, this is interesting because in complete dominance, we would say neither allele is purely dominant. The white allele does not fully obscure the red allele. The red allele does not fully obscure the white allele. The heterozygous phenotype is a collaboration between the activities or the contributions of both alleles. So if we actually, now on the next slide, here titled, There's More to Life Than Simple Dominance, we have kind of a nice um, outline of this and also some real data generated. I believe this data was generated originally by Punnett himself or one of the other kind of early investigators in, uh, in uh, crosses. But <clears throat> what do we see in this case? We see a P0 generation where we have true breeding red. We have a, another parent in the P0 generation, true breeding white, homozygous red, homozygous white. These two plants are mated together, the pollen perhaps from the red, uh, daubed on to the pistil uh, of the white plant. This allows a fertilization to occur. The resulting seed is planted in the ground. When it germinates and grows, it produces a flower, the F1 flower, in the case of this cross, which is pink heterozygous. If we allow that flower to self-fertilize, we uh, enter into the interesting situation where now, rather than, for instance, just getting pink out, just getting white or getting red out, we see that the parental traits reemerge. Red flowers and white flowers are being produced again, but also a large number of pink flowers are being produced. And if we actually look at the relative numbers of those flowers here with a real frequentist data set, we see 62 reds being produced, 131 pinks, 57 whites. Now, thinking about the Mendelian genotypic ratios of a monohybrid cross, we begin to think about a classicist model that we would compare our frequentist data to. If we're dealing with alternative alleles at a single genetic locus, and our F1 individual is a heterozygote, the genotypic expectations would be the classic one to two to one ratio. One fourth of our progeny should be homozygous for the red favoring alleles. One fourth of our progeny homozygous for the white favoring alleles. And then one half of our progeny should be heterozygous. So this may just be a simple monohybrid cross a heter the equivalent of a heterozygote by heterozygous cross, and if that cross produces progeny at the expected ratio, we would assume we would see something close to one to two to one. Now, last week we talked quite a bit about the Punnett's, or I'm sorry, excuse me, we talked quite a bit about the chi-square analysis. Well, this is another situation where we could apply the chi-square to test the goodness of fit of our observed data, our frequentist experiment, what we measured and saw against a expected classicist model, which would be the equivalent of one to two to one segregation. Homozygous red, heterozygous, homozygous for the alleles causing pink. 
So how would we do that kind of using a goodness of fit approach? Well, again, on 15, I'm just referring, on slide 15, I'm just referring to the fact that we're going to use a chi-square analysis to test our goodness of fit. So if we just go to the next slide, which would be slide 16, here we have an opportunity to compare our classic expectation, what we would get for this data set if we had one to two to one segregation with our frequentist observed data. To begin with, what we have to ask ourselves is <clears throat> what are the phenotypic classes that we would expect? So we would expect three phenotypic classes, red, homozygous for the allele favoring the intense red color, pink, heterozygous for one of the alleles favoring red, one favoring white, and homozygous for the white favoring allele. So in the first case, uh, using our original nomenclature, we would be homozygous R1, heterozygous R1, R2, or homozygous R2. If we look at our observed numbers in this case, we would say, ah, well, we've got 62 reds, 131 pinks, 57 whites. And then if we looked at our expected numbers, we would simply assume with a 1 to 2 to 1 segregation pattern, one quarter of the total number would be expected to be red homozygous one quarter of the total number would be expected to be white homozygous, and then one half of the total number would be expected to be pink. Now remember, by convention in my class, I just encourage you uh, with the expected number to um, not use half or fractional numbers when you're describing the classic model. Just, just simply uh, round up or round down. So, for instance, with red, if we wanted to, we could say we've got 61 red plants. Here I'm showing 62.5, only because I know that that's also how your book does it. For the pink plants, we could do 125. For the white plants, we could do 63. That would be a close approximation to a real data set. Um, if we do use fractional values, like 62.5, if we make that our expected number, we uh, <laughs> could see very quickly uh, where most of our variation is going to lie in this, or most of the difference is going to lie between our observed and expected populations. There's quite a bit of difference in the number of pinks, less difference if we look at the numbers of reds and whites. Going through the calculation of the chi-square, which I've shown uh, down below, we would have our first observed minus expected squared, 62 minus 62.5 squared, divided by 62.5 are expected. For the pink class, we would have 131 minus 125, that value squared, the difference squared, divided by 125, our expected number for heterozygotes. And then finally, for the white homozygotes, we would have 57 minus 62.5 squared divided by 62.5. The sum chi-squared in this experiment then would simply be 0 0.776. Now we would have the opportunity to go to a chi-squared table, looking at the chi-squared table for the degree of freedom that we would generate from these three different phenotypic classes. Remember that the degrees of freedom is the number of phenotypic classes minus one. We would see that in fact our p-value is very, very high, significantly above 0.7, and that would indicate that there is quite good goodness of fit between our observed and expected, our frequentist and classic model in this case, and that would mean we would not reject the hypothesis that we are seeing one to two to one segregation. Thus, this gives us really good statistical assurance 
that are model, homozygosity for one allele gives us red, heterozygosity gives us pink, homozygosity for the alternative allele gives us white, um, that that hypothesis shows goodness of fit to the data that we've generated and, therefore, that the pink phenotype is a collaboration showing incomplete dominance between the two alleles that are segregating in this experiment. <clears throat> now, another form of allelic interaction that I want to discuss is codominance. So this is a fascinating situation where, in effect, both alleles present in the cell, alternative forms of the same gene, remember, in diploids, you have two possible forms, one coming from the paternal side, one coming from the maternal side, that both alleles make their presence known in a heterozygote in, in a fully evident way in the phenotype. The genotype is perfectly translated into the phenotype. So you can think of this as a perspective where both alleles are, do are dominant. If both alleles are present, the phenotype will be both alleles present. If only one allele is present in a homozygote, the phenotype will be whatever that allele drives. If the other alternative form allele is all that is present in a homozygote, conversely, the cell and the organism will only have that phenotype. So here, we don't have a simple dominance interaction because in effect, both alleles are fully dominant. So, <clears throat> the human blood type, the ABO blood typing system, really highlights the fact that for a single gene in a relatively large population, a number of alleles are possible. So here we're going to be looking at um, genes that confer to red blood cells specific types of surface protein electrostatic shapes by how they modify those proteins with the addition of different carbohydrates, different sugars. So the gene that is under consideration here is the isoglutinogen locus, or the I gene. And if we survey human populations broadly in the world, we discover three fairly common alternative forms or alleles for this gene. I superscript A, I superscript B, and I superscript O. Now remember, in a situation where there is no simple dominance interaction, we don't make one allele capital, the other lowercase, one allele having a plus, the other being lowercase with no superscript or with the superscript minus. If we have codominance, we simply show all the alleles as capitals with their appropriate superscript. So the gene locus is the locus I. The allele type at each gene locus is either A, B, or O. Now, <clears throat> I have given you here, and again, I'm sorry, this codominance, this is slide 17, I have given you here a simple equation for estimating the possible number of genotypes that you can get with different types of um, allele numbers at a particular locus if they are all available within a population. Here all you have to do is calculate the number of alleles that you have. For instance, if you have one allele the number of genotypes that you can be produce is calculated by the equation n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Well, if we plug 1 in for n, we have 1 times 1 plus 1 divided by 2. That is equivalent to 2 divided by 2. That equals 1. If we only have one allele, only one genotype is possible. Similarly, if we have three alleles at a genetic locus, we substitute 3 for n. We have 3 times 3 plus 1 divided by 2. 3 times 4 is 12, divided by 2 is 6. With three different alleles, 
uh, as we see in the case of the ABO blood type, we would expect there to be six different possible genotypes. Now let's just run through them in our mind here and see if we believe that outcome. Do we really believe it? Well, if we have A, B, and O present in the population, but any parent can only have two of those alleles sampled, we would think that in a normal diploid human, <laughs> which we will assume everyone is in this experiment uh, or in this observation, um, the possibilities would be a genotype could have two A alleles, I superscript A, I superscript A, or for the purposes of this discussion, we'll simply call them A, IA. Another alternative would be from one parent you have the I superscript A allele, for the other parent you got the I superscript B allele. That would give you a genotype AB, I superscript A, I superscript B. Well, we know the B alleles out there in the wild, that would mean we would potentially have the possibility of two parents carrying B alleles mating, thus we would have the possibility of having a BB genotype. The O allele is another wrinkle in the mix. Well, how might it be combined? We could have an A allele coming from one parent, the O allele from the other. Alternatively, we could have the B allele coming from one parent, the O allele coming from the other. Or we could have a situation where both parents produce gametes that have O alleles producing a zygote that is O over O. If we run through all of these possibilities, what are they? AA, BB, AB, AO, BO, and OO. Six different possibilities, exactly as we would expect using our simple calculation. So now let's progress on to slide 18. Um, so here I want to get a little bit more deeply into the background about uh, this unique gene set, the ABO blood group in humans, um, how we develop uh, within our own bodies the tools to recognize our blood either or blood that we have circulating in our uh, blood system as being self or non-self in origin coming from our own hematopoietic stem cells or coming in from a donation through a transfusion by a donor. Um, and also even thinking a little bit here moving into the future about how we originally develop uh, sensitivities and transfusion disease possibility simply by being born. So to begin with, if we think about this, let's describe the impact of these different alleles on a surface protein on a red blood cell. So the isoglutinogen locus, again, it makes alternative forms of an enzyme. What does this enzyme do? It adds a sugar to proteins that will eventually find themselves on the surface of the red blood cell. So the IA allele is responsible for an allelic form uh, of the enzyme that can add the terminal sugar and acetyl galactosamine, excuse me, uh, ac gallon. <laughs> Sometimes when you talk to sugar biochemists, it starts sounding like they're coughing up hairballs. <laughs> But um, this N-acetylgalactosamine sugar can be added to uh, a protein which is referred to as the H substance. So here we have the protein on the surface of the red blood cell. The sugar that it is put on top of it changes that protein's, if you will, electrostatic surface, how it would appear to anything encountering it as it flows through a blood vessel. The IB allele, interestingly, in a similar way, um, encodes an alternative form of the enzyme that will again take H, subject, H substance, but now, rather than decorate it with N-acetylgalactosamine, 
it will instead simply add galactose, uh, a relatively simple sugar. Now, what about the O form of this allele? What about the I superscript O allele for this enzyme? Well, it turns out if you have an IO phenotype, you've, you now have a form of the gene um, that will not put a sugar on the H substance. So you can think of O as, in effect, an absence of a sugar on the H substance. So all you see on your surface is H substance itself. H is found on the red blood surface in individuals that are OO, but they don't have H decorated with and acetylgalactosamine or galactose. So now on slide 19, I'm just <laughs> inflicting a tiny little bit of structural chemistry on you, just a tiny bit of organic. Uh, when we look at the different sugar molecules and their shape differences uh, as they're added to H. So again, remember the I superscript A allele adds N acetylgalactosamine to H, the IB allele adds galactose, the IO, or in some literature, the small i allele adds no carbohydrate to H. Now, interestingly, students often ask the question, well, where does H come from? Well, it turns out that uh, a protein called fucosyl transferase, or FUT, <laughs> produces the H substance to begin with. So if we kind of look at the very short, uh, if you will, genetic pathway between the construction of H to the decoration of H, first you have an H substance precursor. The fucosyl transferase gene FUT1 uh, changes that by producing H substance through the addition of uh, a sugar, a short sugar chain. Then the IA allele will take that H substance and add another terminal sugar to it, uh, N-acetylgalactosamine. Or alternatively, if you have um, the I superscript B allele, that H substance will be decorated with galactose. So here we have an interesting kind of collection of genes. If FUT works, H substance gets produced from a, from a simpler sugar uh, moiety. And then if IA is present, the A antigenic form is produced through the addition of the appropriate sugar. If IB is present, the B form of this sugar complex is formed. This multi-ring carbohydrate structure is formed. Here we can then ask the question, well, what's happening in different genotypes? Why do we say, for instance, that an A allele and a B allele are co-dominant, are fully present in the phenotype if both alleles are fully reflected in the phenotype if both alleles are present in the genotype? Well, the reason we say that is that H substance um, will be presented as a precursor to either of the enzyme forms. If within a cell the IA form of the enzyme is present and the IE, IB form of the enzyme is present, each of these enzymes will be drawing from the same pool of H substance and will be converting them into B antigen and A antigen respectfully, or vice versa. So that means that a red blood cell um, derived from a hematopoietic stem cell in which both of these alleles are present in the genome will decorate itself with H substance with the A addition or the B addition, thus to the um, fluid volume of the blood system, uh, those red blood cells will be presenting both of these structures to the blood plasma, to the fluid in the blood. We'll see in just a bit why that's important. So here we're going to see red blood cells that have a variety of different, if you will, decorations. 
They'll be decorated with A. They might be decorated with B. They might be decorated with both A and B, or in the case of an I superscript O homozygote, they will be decorated with neither A or B and will only have H substance on the surface. So now let's transition to slide 20 and talk just a little bit about why these sugars matter. So I don't know at this point in your um, biological education if you've had much of an introduction uh, to the different parts of the immune system. But one of the active immune systems um, that actually produces uh, the soluble branch of the immune system, it produces the antibodies, um, forms these structures, these complex protein structures, which are called antibodies. So what are antibodies? They're complex molecules. They're composed of multiple proteins linked together. Uh, different ones are produced by different alleles. They have a lot of variability, and they're part of the what's referred to as the adaptive immune system. When we get an inoculation, for instance, if we get a flu vaccine, the proteins that are present in that flu vaccine stimulate the production of appropriate responding antibodies, and we now develop an active adaptive immunity to specific flu viruses, which may be presenting these um, proteins on their surface. Thus, our antibodies bind to those proteins. They call in aspects of the cellular immune system, which will then hopefully engulf and destroy any invader that's circulating in our blood, that's, that's present in our blood plasma. So how do antibodies do this? So antibodies have, if you'll notice on the light chain, in what I've referred to as the antigen-specific part of the antibody, um, there are electrostatic surfaces there that will fit in kind of a lock and a key, like sort of leg two Legos coming together, will fit and recognize uh, protein in, in particular targets for an invading pathogen. So if we have an exposure to a bacteria, our active immune system will be, and adaptive immune system will begin producing antibodies, and eventually we can clear an infection on our own if our antibodies are given enough time to first expand to a high enough concentration in our blood to be effective, and then clear the system by binding to their targets and calling for their destruction. So it's an incredibly powerful thing. The problem with our adaptive immune system is that um, we generally, or well, I won't say a problem, but a feature of our adaptive immune system is we generally don't develop antibodies against our own native proteins. If we ever do that, we develop, uh, or biomolecules, we develop autoimmune diseases. We develop um, inflammation of our joints because of the activity of antibodies interacting with various proteins and pro-inflammatory factors causing arthritis. If we develop antibodies against DNA, we can develop lupus because we start developing antibodies against any free DNA that is found present in our body, which causes various types of inflammation, arrhythmia, and other types of problems. So we usually don't produce anti-self antibodies. Our immune system has built-in safeguards uh, designed to make sure that we ignore our own cells. Otherwise, we would quite literally self-destruct. However, we have a very um, effective interaction to outside uh, invaders, to viruses, to bacteria, to other uh, protein antigen bearing uh, structures that if they find their way into our bloodstream, our immune system has a very rapid reaction and will eventually try to clear through destruction all of those invaders. 
So how do we develop things like antibodies against something like whole blood? If we take in a transfusion that is not a compatible transfusion, if I am an A individual and B blood from a B donor is transfused into me, I very um, quickly develop what's referred to as transfusion disease. I have an incompatible transfusion. Uh, I start having lots of red blood cells rupturing. That those red blood cells release a variety of factors like cytokines. They can cause me fever, all sorts of other problems, and I can become gravely ill and even die from an incompatible transfusion. Why does my body recognize human blood as an invader? Well, it's quite interesting. The reason this happens is simply because we are born. Uh, as we traverse the birth canal, we're exposed to a variety of bacteria. To be frank, this is going to sound a little gross, but we think they're mostly, uh, they, they mostly have soil as their origin. You know, there are a lot of epiphytes, a lot of epiphytic bacteria just hanging around on human bodies. And so as we pass through the birth canal, we become inoculated with these bacteria. Why is this a problem? Some of these bacteria have surface proteins that mimic, we believe, primarily through happenstance, through just uh, an accident of evolutionary history, um, the surface antigens or the surface proteins of red blood cells. Now, when we're infected with these soil bacteria, even as babies, we develop a very strong immune response to them. So if a bacteria comes in mimicking B and we have A blood, our immune system will very quickly develop anti-B antibodies to try and clear that bacteria. However, if we then get an incorrect unmatched transfusion of B blood, our antibodies that were raised against our bacterial exposure will now try to destroy that donor blood, make us very sick, etc. So bacteria have many of the same carbohydrates and types of carbohydrates decorating different structures on their surface that red blood cells do. So if you are an A individual, you very quickly get exposed to B carrying bacteria and develop anti-B antibodies. If you are a B individual, you very quickly develop anti-A antibodies. If you're an AB individual, you do not develop antibodies to either of those structures and other antibodies targeting other parts of the bacterial cell surface structure um, are developed, which will eventually destroy those cells. Kids that are AB don't die from bacterial infection because they can't make either anti-A or anti-B antibodies. They still clear the infection, although, although there are some interesting studies that suggest that they might have a little bit harder time doing that clearage, clearance. Individuals that are O are fascinating because their red blood cells have neither the A or the B antigen on the surface. They develop both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So our immune system will not permit us to develop antibodies against our own cells, but it will let us develop antibodies against bacterial invaders that will ultimately cross-react or um, interact accidentally through happenstance with blood that is transfused into us that does not match our blood type. So this type of adaptive immunity can perdure. Um, if we are A, we have anti-B antibodies. Those anti-B antibodies will be at a consistent high titer in our blood. If we're anti, uh, if we are B, I'm sorry, if we're B, we'll have anti-A antibodies. If we're A, we'll have anti-B antibodies. If we are AB, we will develop neither antibody because if we developed either one of them, we would destroy our own blood 
And if we are O, we develop both anti-A and anti-B. So now let's transition to uh, slide 22 that kind of shows this setup. So here we have kind of a set of red blood cells decorated with these alternative forms. Here in the upper slide we see a human red blood cell of type A covered in A antigen. Right below that we have a human red blood cell of type B covered in B antigen. If, for instance, we mix uh, blood plasma that has been isolated and actually isolate the protein fraction of that that has antibodies in it. If that blood has been isolated uh, from an individual um, who has B or BO blood and has anti-A antibodies, if we mix those antibodies with A blood, we see a process called agglutination. The blood cells quickly clump together into these kind of large floating mats. If, however, we add that same antibody mix to red blood cells that are covered in the B antigen, you don't see any agglutination. So this was one of the first early tests for compatibility. The absence of agglutination suggested that at least the red blood cell fraction of a donor's blood was compatible with any potential donor uh, for, for whom their antibody or antigenicity had been tested. <clears throat> so kind of down below, what do we see here where it says table 1.2? Relations between cellular antigens, serum antibodies, and genotypes of the four phenotypes in the ABO blood group. Again, if our phenotype is A, our red cell antigen is A, thus we're going to produce a serum antibody, anti-B. The genotypes that would produce that are A, I superscript A homozygotes, or I superscript A, o super, I superscript O heterozygotes. In shorthand, the AA homozygotes or the AO heterozygotes are all A blood type, and they produce anti-B antibodies. All of the other sets you can see, I'll let you guys work those out when you uh, kind of discuss it in your various study groups. It'll give you an opportunity to justify for yourself why a blood genotype, a blood cell genotype, results in antibodies of the complementary type. It's simply because we cannot make antibodies against our own blood or we would quickly die. Now, <clears throat> one interesting thing also about the human blood types is if we think about the genetic pathway and the pattern in which the genetic pathway functions in order to make sure that an appropriate antigen is assembled on a red blood cell. I told you about this fucosyl transferase gene, uh, FUT1, which produces H substance. Then I told you about the enzymes and their alternative forms that will either modify H substance by turning it into A antigen or B antigen. So if we think about this in terms of a genetic network, the FUT gene has to function first in order to permit H substance to develop. If the FUT gene does not act, the isoagglutinogen locus has nothing to modify. The H substance is, in, is essentially a substrate that the isoagglutinogen protein modifies into either A or B. So you see some interesting pathway phenomena with some human mutations that do ultimately affect the blood type. So here on slide 24, I've talked about genetic pathways a little bit in biochemistry and development. We talked a little bit about this when we were talking a bit about um, nodes and edges in genetic networks. But here this is kind of logic 101. If you have a linear dependent genetic pathway, that is, gene A leads to gene B, leads to gene C, leads to gene D. What does that mean?
that means that the function of presumably the wild type allele of A is required for the function of the wild type allele of B is required for the function of C and then the function of D. If there is an interruption at any point in that chain, if, for instance, we're homozygous recessive for A, A's activity never occurs, well, because B, C, and D are ultimately dependent on the activity of A, none of their events will be able to occur either. Now, we'll talk about this in the context of the um, blood group antigen genes in just a bit, but this usually means that earlier acting genes have an effect that will obscure the activity of later acting genes. If FUT, for instance, never acts, the genotype at the isoglutinogen locus will be, in effect, irrelevant. If FUT never produces H, there is no H there for the isoglutinogen enzyme to convert to A or B. In the absence of bricks and mortar, you can't build a house. In the absence of H, you can't build an A or B antigen. So let's kind of examine what happens then when we do some things like ask a question, well, what if an individual is particularly unlucky and they have um, a mutation in multiple genes in the same linear dependent pathway? What if you have a mutation in the A gene and in the C gene? How does that influence uh, the genotype and the phenotype that the individual shows that, that is missing those functions. Well, it turns out in a linear dependent, what we refer to as positive pathway, where there's a positive requirement for the activity of each gene in the, in the, um, in the network or pathway that we're considering, if you mutate an earlier gene, the genotype of subsequent genes becomes irrelevant. Now, this reveals a type of interactions that is somewhat similar to what we see when we think about allelic interactions between alleles of the same gene. Big A being dominant to little a, little a being recessive to big A, or any of the other possible dominance interactions. Here, a mutation in gene A may obscure the presence of a mutation at gene C because in the absence of A, C's activity becomes irrelevant. These types of interactions are referred to as epistasis. We're going to be exploring them for the remainder of this uh, presentation. So now let's get back on slide 26 to what happens when we consider the impact of mutations and the impact of antigen flow, if you will, through the genetic network, um, if we consider mutations in the gene FUT1 or in the isoglutinogen locus. So if we have mutations segregating in both FUT and I, we began to get some very interesting behaviors in pedigrees. So first off, what I've done here is I've outlined the genetic network that's under consideration. To begin with, we have our H substance precursor. H substance precursor is used as a substrate by FUT, by fucosyl transferase enzyme, to produce H substance. H substance accumulates, then it reaches a concentration where it is sufficiently available to isoglutinogen to be converted by that enzyme into either the final antigen type, A, B, or if it isn't able to produce one of those antigen types, O. So this is interesting. H substance, I'm sorry, pardon me, H substance is the substrate for FUT. It is the precursor of everything else. FUT converts H substance precursor into H substance itself. 
H substance then is the substrate for isoglutinogen. It is in turn converted into the final antigen form A, B, or O. So here we have kind of a, if you will, bucket brigade, a, a pattern of dependencies. FUT must ask, act first. Its substrate has to be available. It produces a product. That product then makes itself available to isoglutinogen. Isoglutinogen locus uh, then converts, isoglutinogen locus then converts that precursor into its product. The ultimate starting substrate, H substance precursor, the intermediate H substance, the final product of the entire pathway, A or B antigen, or in the absence of pathway function, O. So now let's think about a situation where we have a genotype, if we transition to the next slide, slide 27, where we have a genotype of an individual that is I superscript A, homozygote, or I superscript A, I superscript O, heterozygote. These individuals may have a normal fucosyl transferase, FUT is going to produce, is going to take the H substance and produce, or is going to take the H substance precursor and produce the H substance. The H substance will then be converted by the A form of the I protein into the final antigen A. So here we have a situation where H substance precursor, because of the genes that are present in the pathway, fucosyl transferase and isoglutinogen, the only possible outcome for individuals with these genotypes is A antigen. Their red blood cells are coated in A antigen. Their serum develops anti-B antibodies. These individuals can accept A or O blood. They can only donate to A or um, uh, a, B individuals, uh, but anyway, their, their, their genotype and their phenotype is basically determined by the activity of this genetic network based on the alleles that are available. Now, if we contrast that, here we're looking at slide 28, with a situation in which now we have an individual whose genotype is I, B, B homozygote, or BO heterozygote, their blood type is blood type B, now the fucosyl transferase will still take the H substance precursor and turn it into H substance, but the B locus now converts it only into the B antigen form. What does that mean? These individuals' red blood cells will be covered in B antigen. Their Serum will accumulate anti-A antibodies. These individuals will accept blood from B or BO donors. They will accept blood from O donors. And they are appropriate donors to individuals that have the B genotype or the AB genotype. Interestingly, O donors under this model are universal donors. They can donate blood to anyone, but they have the most restrictions in terms of the blood they can accept because they are producing antibodies against both A and B. They can accept no A alone blood, no B alone blood, no AB blood. The only blood they can accept is O blood. Now, what happens with the individuals who are O? who are I superscript O homozygotes, shorthand OO, their blood type is O. These individuals have a normal uh, fucosyl transferase gene. They are normally capable of taking H substance precursor and turning it into H substance, but that's where the pathway stops. O has no ability to take H substance and turn it into anything. Because of that, in these individuals, 
they produce red blood cells that do not have one of the normal red blood cell antigens on them. They may accumulate H substrate or H substance on the surface, but they will not accumulate O, I'm sorry, they will not accumulate A or B. What happens if we have a mutation in the first gene, in the FUT gene? Well, this is fascinating. Here, H substance precursor accumulates. So now we are on slide 30. I'm sorry, excuse me. Here, H substance precursor accumulates, but it is never converted into H substance. Even if you are wild type at, or if you are A or B for your isoglutinogen locus, um, you will never have H substance to convert into A or B. This is quite fascinating because this produces a, a very interesting variant O blood type. The genotype of these individuals may be AA, AB, BB, AO, BO, or potentially OO, but for all of those genotypes, their phenotype is O. They are not able to produce either A or B antigen on the surface of the red blood cells. So here we're seeing the activity of an early enzyme in the pathway being absolutely required for the activity of later enzymes. If FUT doesn't work, no intermediate product and substrate is made, no H substance is made. In the absence of H substance, the genotype at the I locus is irrelevant. If a person is a FUT FUT homozygote, let's say that's uh, little f, little f, their genotype at I becomes irrelevant. This is a beautiful example of a linear dependent pathway. The FUT gene must act earlier it must have a normal allele, or you will not get its intermediate product, the H substance. If FUT does not act, the genotype at the downstream genes is irrelevant. Any combination of alleles will only give you the O phenotype. So <clears throat> we first saw this in something that's referred to as the Bombay pedigree. This is a uh, pedigree showing inheritance of the Bombay allele of the FUT gene. If we do a pedigree diagnosis, what do we see? Well, here we see a set of progeny that are A, B, A, and B. This is in generation three. In generation two, individual 2-2 two, two, and 2-3 two, have interesting phenotypes. Individual 2-3 is A, meaning they must either be I superscript A homozygotes or AO heterozygotes. But the other parent's phenotype is O. This leads to a conundrum. Where do the B alleles in the next generation come from? It turns out that this individual must, at a minimum, be BO. Um, they can't be BB. <laughs> we believe that they are, in fact, BO, but, but there has to be a B allele present there, yet their phenotype is O. Why? Segregating in the background of this family is a partial loss of function mutation in FUT. That means in a homozygote, not enough fucosyl transferase is made to produce the H substance. Thus, even though this individual's genotype is BO, their phenotype is O because there is no precursor present for their B allele to produce the B antigen. So, <clears throat> she is an obvious I superscript B allele donor to her ch two children. If we progress to slide 32, the woman was subsequently found to be a homozygous 
fucosyl transferase locus mutation. Since there was no fucus, fucose in the H substance, there was no substrate to make A or B antigens, even though her genotype was most likely BO, her phenotype could only be O, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, <clears throat> so whenever we have this type of interaction, this sort of um, uh, negotiation between alleles of two genes, interaction between alleles of two genes, that is sort of reminiscent to the dominance interactions that are present for alleles at a single gene, we refer to this phenomena as epistasis. These are interactions between alleles of different genes. They might be on non-homologous chromosomes. They might be anywhere else in the genome. But they're still showing an interaction with each other, presumably because of an intervening genetic pathway. When you have epistasis, what does this mean? The genotype at one gene can obscure the influence of the genotype at the other gene. We just saw that with FUT. If fucosyl transferase is missing from a cell, the genotype at the isoglutinogen locus is in fact irrelevant. So how do we describe the type of interaction we've just talked about? Thus, the HH genotype at the FUT gene, the little h, little h homozygous, complete loss of function, is epistatic to any genotype at the I locus. All of the alleles at I are hypostatic to alleles at H. So if you're a little h, little h homozygote, your genotype at I, AA, AB, BB, AO, BO, or OO is irrelevant. Your phenotype is controlled by the genotype at the first locus. The first locus mutation is epistatic to any genotype at the second locus, and your overall phenotype is O. All the alleles at I are hypostatic to alleles at H. Homozygous loss of function at H is epistatic to any genotype at I. So this takes us up to section 4.7. At this point, I'm right at an hour, and so um, I believe that I will be able to start on slide 34 when we reconvene on Monday after I return from my trip. Um, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I will post this to YouTube, and I will also uh, forward that YouTube link to you guys through email on Sakai. Um, please send me an email if you have any problems. I am going to try and encode this in the standard format so that you should be able to both view it on YouTube and download it if you so wish. Have a great weekend. Dr. Pickett out! Ha, ha, ha.